Miss Tabron, how are you? I'm well, how are you? I'm doing real well. I just wanted to speak with you today as the Delaware State Teacher of the Year for 2022. <laughs> Congratulations to you. How Thank is you. everything going this season? Uh, it's been busy, uh, but it's been wonderful and it's a, a blessing to, you know, be able to have your voice heard and speak for the teachers and the students of Delaware. <laughs> Do you feel as though your voice is now being heard? I I want to preface that by saying <laughs> teachers' voices haven't always been heard, right? This, teachers yeah. have gone on strikes. What is it like now? Is your voice being heard? Well, I mean, I'm, I think I make the decision to speak for people whenever I enter a room. So I, I hope that, um, I hope that I'm being heard. I hope that I'm being listened to. And uh, I think I am, you know, I, I think I've been in more meetings this year than, than probably the last three years combined. And that's a lot coming from a special education teacher, but um, I am hopeful. I, so I guess that's a good way of looking at it. I'm hopeful. They announced the teachers of the year for the states earlier in the year. So about around October, you know, in yeah. the fall, mm -hmm. what is that announcement like and how did it make you feel? So the process is actually probably over two years, not two years, it's like a, a year and a half in the making. So I won for my school and then I won for my district. And then you meet all of the amazing people in your uh, 2022 Teacher of the Year cohort for Delaware. Uh, and you understand that the competition is what it is. I mean, you work with amazing people in the state, in your school. So I don't think that you, it's something that you take for granted, you know? So that night that I went, it was just awesome to hear everyone's story. And there was a moment of shock when they said my name, because I was just like, that can't be right. Who, who said that? But um, it, it was a wonderful, wonderful feeling to win that. And you're a special education teacher. So you are in a unique class of your own being brought into this cohort. What did it mean for special education teachers to finally get their due? The thing about um, being a special education teacher is that you were always working. And I think we do a really good job of speaking up for all students. Um, you know, I don't necessarily work with students who have significant um, abilities, be it really high or, or really needing a lot of help. I work with a lot of students who are just like you and, and myself, students who maybe missed a portion of time and need a little bit of extra help in an area. Um, and I think that when we're looking at the kids who fall in the middle, you don't necessarily hear from those teachers that often. So I think it's like a great honor. And, you know, my kids are taking time to brag, like, that's my teacher. She's the teacher of the year. Whereas most kids are like, oh, I don't want anyone to know that that's my teacher. I think it's, cre <laughs> it's created a different situation this time. Wow. So um, I appreciate that. Um, so there isn't that stigma anymore about, you know, kids and how they feel about their teachers the students in your class they really care for you and they really love you and want to see you shine yes they they do brag with me and they actually if you ask some of them they will say they that I won because of them because of course you know they are so wonderful uh and it's interesting there still may be a stigma but I think more young people are recognizing and I hope that everybody else is that special education is education for everyone, you know, depending on where you are, gifted students are considered students who require special education, right? So my job is really just to make it individual instead of thinking about the students um, and what they're lacking. I try to look at what the student can bring to the table and focus in on those strengths and help them grow from there. So there are a bunch of students who are like, oh, can you, are you the lady who helps people <laughs> with this? So I'm, I'm randomly helping a bunch of kids, not just my students, but I guess, you know, students who feel as though I'm going to look at what they have to offer and, and help bring that out a little bit more. 
let's step inside of your classroom right now as I look at the graded papers all behind you um, in your amazing, wonderful classroom. Uh, it looks like a teacher's classroom. You know, it, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't feel right if there wasn't stuff everywhere on a bulletin board. Stuff everywhere. Yes. Bulletin Just board. Welcome to my life. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> on, a, on a bulletin board, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so let's step inside of your classroom. What are you bringing to your students? What are the struggles that students face in schools right now? There's a lot happening. You know, um, I happen to work in Wilmington and we have a significant poverty rate. And that's not just it. We also unfortunately have a, a lot of um, violence that takes place in certain portions. And we're in a unique situation because um, this is one place that I've lived where you are within blocks of a completely different reality. I mean, I'm talking about the wealthiest people and then within a mile, you know, you were in a completely different kind of neighborhood. Um, and as a local public school, we serve the best of all of our communities. So I think one of the things that um, we really have to look to is how we service all students. Uh, and right now, I think one of the things that the school is charged with is supporting the needs at, at every level. So not just the educational needs, not just filling in and making up for learning loss, but we also have to be able to provide social emotional support, mental health and wellness, and just an overall uh, understanding of the whole child. And I think that's really what the challenge is. You know, we've been kind of isolated for so long that it, it kind of becomes difficult to remember that those needs are not just there, but probably multiplied because of the pandemic. I think that we have a lot more to do um, in addition to what we were already doing. You mentioned the elephant in the room, okay? Mm -hmm. the, the pandemic, the mm -hmm. mental health of students, everything that students are facing right now. We're almost two years into this pandemic. You're, you're sitting inside of your classroom and I know you're with them every single day. Mm -hmm. But what is it gonna take for us to really get over the hump? You know, in your words, what do school communities need to do at this critical moment right now? Um, I think there is so much focus on learning loss that we are not necessarily looking to learning right now in the moment. Um, and I think we need to focus on growing kids where they are, you know, instead of giving the continuous narrative of they have lost so much, what have they gained? Have they gained empathy? Have they gained compassion? You know, are we still giving opportunities to facilitate conversations? What other skills? I mean, I think if we focus on just the deficits, that's all we'll see. But, you know, when we give opportunities for kids to show us what they have learned, you, you'd be surprised. I mean, there are kids here who are continuously my tech support. Whenever I need something, they offer that opportunity. So I can't really say that I'm focusing on the negatives. I think I'm, I'm really trying to focus on what I have to work with. And I wish that a lot of people would, uh, you know, not try to create these self fulfilling prophecies of loss and look at a student like, okay, where are we now and how can we grow from there? Mm. I think the isolation and the politicization of the mask mandates and of whether or not schools should be open or closed and we're seeing walkouts and we're seeing strikes, all of that, you know, these seven, eight, nine, 10, all the way up until 18 year old students are facing. That's mm -hmm. a lot for them right now. But on the flip side, definitely. On the flip side, teachers are facing so much right now. I, I spoke with the 2021 Virginia State Teacher of the Year just mm -hmm. a few weeks ago, Anthony Swan, and he was telling me about walking teachers off the ledge, definitely. getting on Twitter <laughs> and saying, Look, we need you. Stay in mm -hmm. the game, stay with it. Okay. And there are states now that are bringing in substitutes and bringing in the National Guard and they don't know what to do and what's going on. In your school, in your district and 
all that you do as a state teacher of the year. How much is this affecting you? Um, it really does make you rethink your own mental health. You know, on, on any given day when you feel like you can't do it, you're like, if I call out, is my colleague now going to have to cover my class? Should I call out? What can I do? The sub shortage, the teacher shortage, it's, it does weigh on us heavily. And, you know, I look forward to the day when you walk into a meeting and someone starts off by saying, here's what we are taking off of your plate today. Not, not what else we're going to put on, not, you know, not, not, not just going not on there. This. Yes. <laughs> let's, let's take some stuff off of the teacher's plate. Um, but you really bring up a good point. I think um, everyone gets nervous when they feel like their safety is compromised and be that health safety, be that mental safety, um, be that physical safety, because you are bringing people back into an environment that has kind of stayed the same while the world was changing, right? So it's kind of something that you have to look at in education. As the world continues to change, will we continue to put more on the place or will we change with it? Will we start supporting, you know, mental health in schools more? Will we start supporting teachers and students the way they need to be supported? Um, and it seems to me, as always, that a lot of people who haven't been in a classroom in a very long time have a lot of opinions. So I think that um, that's always going to be something Speak to interesting, it. <laughs> you know, and, and not, not in a negative way, but I, I mean, I think that if we are building communities that are education focused and, and, and student and child focused all throughout the great state of Delaware and all around our nation, maybe we need to make uh, responsibilities with the community a priority so that you can actually see what happens here because it's very easy to make decisions from a high tower. It's also very easy to sit someplace outside of a room of 30 plus students and decide that we should not, you know, have masks or we should not do this. But until you are in here, I, I, you know, I don't know that you really have all of the information that you need to make these decisions. And no one likes wearing a mask, but when you have to think beyond yourself and your family about people who have compromised immune systems or, or whoever lives with whomever you don't know and you know that's why I think it's, it's it's better to be compassion focused than it is to start thinking about well if if I were in the schools I would do this why don't we come in and you become part of our community and then you can maybe contribute on a different level because you'll have experience here. For those individuals who haven't been in school communities since they were in high school how much should we focus and prioritize mental health? So if we're looking at the need for mental health, right? If school is a vehicle for life preparedness, right? If that is what we're saying, that what you learn in school prepares you for life, sometimes the lesson that we're teaching kind of has to be translated. What does this look like in the world? Is there not a time where I will need to do something to protect the safety of someone else? Is there a time where I will have to be a little bit more empathetic and understand something? And I think that these are all valuable lessons. You know, the last thing that we need to show kids is what disagreement looks like among adults. Because if they're looking to us to provide the leadership, we kind of need to be modeling what it looks like to be compassionate, to be empathetic, and to understand that there are a variety of factors that influence what we need to do to help this machine run. And I, and I think that's really something that we're missing out on. I want to ask you about something you brought up earlier. Teachers are being asked to do so much right now. Double duty, different jobs. They don't want to call out because they don't know if they have a sub and if they're going to have to put all of their work onto someone else. And you're saying that it's been piled on over mm -hmm. these last 20, 22 months or so. 
what's one thing that you would like to perhaps be taken off of your plate? What's one thing that would really help you do the work that you do? Because the work works. I heard mm-hmm. you say that before. You said that on Instagram posts. You said the work works. So the if you can do the work <laughs> until it works, what would you take off so that you could do it even better? Well, I do think uh, that some, <laughs> you've, you've seen the memes before, where some meetings could be an email. <laughs> All right. <Okay. laughs> some meetings could be an email. Uh, But really, I think that it would be awesome to ask teachers what they really need. Like, what do you, your needs may be completely different from mine. What do I need? Maybe um, I need water in my classroom for my students, or would they need an outside break, or they need something else. But when I say remove some of the things off of the plate, you know, that doesn't mean remove my responsibilities, but sometimes that means help me hold this heavy plate, right? <laughs> help me hold this plate. What can I do to be supported a little bit more? What can you do to support my kids? What can we offer them? Um, what can we offer the teachers in their classrooms? What would help you? Is it technology? Is it better Wi-Fi connection? Is it managing some of the responsibilities about making contacts and making rules in terms of attendance and things of that nature. I think there's a lot left for us to figure out. Um, And and I don't know that anybody has any additional time. You know, that's something we can never ask for. I don't think we can get extra time, but I think we need to just figure out how to help with the load. And before we try to say it's way too much to ask on an individual basis what every teacher needs, I don't think it is. I don't think it is. I think um, with everything that we've done, someone could say, what would help make your classroom better? Uh, Or give a couple choices, water, you know, access to a break, an outside break, access to this, lunch provided. You know what, we're going to remove one of these duties or something else from you. Um, So really the basics. Yeah, the basics, I'm so serious. I'm thinking that's what it is right now. At this point, we are we are forgetting basic needs, basic human needs, right? We're just like run, 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 and do this too. Where we kind of maybe need to slow down and say, okay, let's take a moment. What do we need? You know, what would make you happy? Imagine someone asked you, what would make you happier here? Mm-hmm. What can I do to support you? Just you listening to that, I think, would change my performance. Well, what are you looking forward to as we progress with this year? Is there anything that (laughs) excites you about the rest of the 2022 school year? Well, I mean, I hope that um, as I am in more meetings, we really get to a place where- More meetings. Did you just say, you just say more meetings. Not as a look forward to, but as I am in other meetings, I'm hoping that from that, we kind of come up with ideas where we understand that education is directly tied to the community and not to add more responsibility. I do think we need to look at how we can support our community. I mean, I think if we could do that, we would change some of the difficulties that we're having in school, right? Because if we can connect with parents and if we can connect with jobs and if we can connect people with other community members I think the weight wouldn't be so heavy you know it would be a shared weight of this is what we need to do Um, and that's what people need to understand if we can continue to develop relationships with the community the weight of what we need to do becomes so much lighter it's not just one person it's just not teachers doing it alone it's not administrators doing it alone it's not all the burden of of making up for lost time on students it's everyone and the weight will be lighter thank you so much for coming on to this show uh, thank you. i think you brought out i think you brought up some of the most poignant points about educating this year ask teachers what they need show some compassion <laughs> they, they need more water breaks if the kids need to get outside if they need some fresh air it's the basic decency, humanity, and the basic needs of people in the four walls of schools right now. 
that I hope people listen Absolutely. to when listening to this podcast. So I, I really appreciate you, Miss Joshua Tabron, the Delaware State Teacher of the Thank Year for 2022. You. Thank you so, so much for coming on to the show. I really appreciate it. Happy Black History Month, Black Teacher, Definitely. History, Awareness, <laughs> everything. I just want you all to shine in your lights this year. Is there anything else that you wanted to leave us with? I'm encouraging everyone who can come out and help volunteer. This is a community effort. <laughs> education is for all of us. There we go. Seriously, Seriously education right. is for all of us. Thank you so much right. for the work that you do. It's an amazing job. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me.